All right. Hello. Hello. I am Jerome Armstrong at 18 minute fitness. And I want to apologize. I did this stream two days ago and I decided to take it down. Um, a number of weeks ago, I had essentially quit coffee and it was my daughter's first day of school two days ago. So I decided to treat myself to my favorite cup of coffee and uh, not having had uh, hardly any appreciable amount of caffeine recently, the little bit that I had made it very, very difficult to um, basically collect my thoughts. I felt very jittery, um, very wiry. I was trembling a little bit, couldn't get a full breath in. I was not expecting to have uh, that severe of a reaction to coffee. So uh, today, uncaffeinated, you're going to be going over that same presentation that I had originally created. And uh, with whatever time I have left when that's done, I'll be taking any Q&As in the chat. You can ask me anything about this presentation, anything about diet, exercise, training, supplementation, or if you just want to ask me any kind of uh, life questions in general, I'd be happy to tackle some of those. So the purpose of today's video is to break down what I consider to be the best bodybuilding routine. And let's get into that. Not share. We don't want to do that. We're already off to a bad start. <laughs> so, all right. Today, we're going to cover the criteria that I believe makes a bodybuilding routine the best. I'm going to talk about the actual routine, explain why this routine meets that criteria. I'm going to point out what would be some common critiques of the routine that I suggest, and I'm going to answer them. And then, like I said, finally, if there's any questions in the live chat, I will be answering those. So uh, feel free to get them in. I can't see any of the comments right now, so I will go over all of those as soon as this presentation is done. Now, a bit of a disclaimer to get this started. The following is a theoretical application of my understanding of exercise science. And I claim that the following routine is the best provisionally, and meaning that I will update my position should I come into additional information that changes the theoretical application um, into a cogent bodybuilding routine. Also, I firmly believe that if I'm going to recommend the minimum effective dose of strength training, or exercise or bodybuilding training, then it should be taken to all of its logical extremes. So even if I enjoy training more frequently, um, even if it's more beneficial to train less often, I should train less often. If I enjoy certain exercises that are far less productive in terms of um, the goal, which is stimulating maximum muscle growth with the least amount of wear and tear, then I should put those personal preferences aside in trying to create what I believe is the ideal bodybuilding routine. Now, there is something to be said about personal preferences. To some extent, you have to enjoy whatever exercise routine you're following. Otherwise, you're not likely to keep up with it. Um, but the purpose of this presentation is not to address that part about exercise selection and creating a routine. The purpose of this presentation is to give what I believe to be the theoretical greatest bodybuilding routine. So what criteria makes a routine the best? Well, First of all, if some routines are better than others, and I think we could all agree as a starting point, you know, some exercises are better than others, some workout routines are better than others, then logically it follows that there has to be a best way to train for any given goal. So the best bodybuilding routine, some criteria that we would look at is it has to stimulate muscle growth in all muscle groups, and it should use the least amount of volume to create the optimal stimulus. Now, using the least amount of volume will allow for more resources for recovery. Past a very finite point, doing any more than it is minimally necessary literally constitutes the definition of overtraining, in which case you have to recover from the additional physical stress imposed by your exercise before you can overcompensate with bigger, stronger muscles. So you want to use the least amount necessary to get the best degree of results, period. Now, it also produces the least amount of wear and tear. Again, um, you want to optimally stimulate growth and minimize the inroad into your body or the wear and tear on your body. Now, this might be a little bit um, controversial, but I do believe that the best bodybuilding routine is also the best general strength and fitness routine. The correlation between muscular size and strength is very, very tight. And not everybody has the genetic potential to be a local champion bodybuilder, a national 
level bodybuilder or certainly a professional bodybuilder, people that are replete with the genetic endowments necessary to achieve in bodybuilding at a high level um, will get significant hypertrophy or muscle growth in pretty much any routine that they do. But most people who ever step foot into a gym who want to get a little bit bigger, who want to get stronger, there's not really a such thing as training entirely for strength or entirely for hypertrophy. The two are so closely linked that I'm a big believer you can't really differentiate between the two with your training. The caveat to that is any particular exercise that you do, there is a neurological skill component. So long as any movement is performed at all, the more you perform that precise movement, the better you will get at that movement. And that will be at least a partially contributing factor towards strength gains. So some of your strength gains will come from the involved musculature getting bigger and stronger. And some of the strength gains will come from improved uh, neurological signaling to those muscles about that pathway that'll let you get stronger in that particular movement. Fitness, and this is something that I wish more people in the industry would be more precise with their terminology. Fitness is both general and specific. And a general definition of fitness, I would consider to be a broad ability to perform a wide variety of physically imposing tasks. Somebody is generally fit if they can jog, if they can run a decent distance, a moderate degree of flexibility, um, if they can do a certain number of pull-ups or a wide variety of somewhat athletic looking tasks, that would be generally fit. But fitness is also highly specific. The more you do one very, very precise task, the better you get at that task. So you could be incredibly fit from track running or stationary bike cycling or doing CrossFit, but you might really struggle if you were to spend a couple of weeks roofing a house and you had to put one or two blocks of shingles on your shoulders and huff it up a ladder, you know, on and off all day. Um, that would probably be pretty exhausting. However, the more you do that task, the more efficient you become at that particular pathway and the easier it gets. It doesn't mean that that pathway is necessarily the best way to build size and strength and cardiovascular endurance and overall health and fitness, but that's a good way to get specific fitness. So when people talk about fitness, I think a distinction needs to be made between general fitness, which should improve, you know, provided you are performing any physically imposing activity and giving yourself what you need in terms of recovery to let a positive adaptation happen and specific fitness, which would be a result of performing a precise task um, relatively frequently. Now, strength training. Strength training will improve all of the following. Obviously, the strength of the muscles involved. It'll improve the joint composition of the muscles will pull on the tendons, which will pull on the bones, and it'll carry a positive adaptation towards uh, joint composition. Cardiovascular conditioning, which is largely a result of um, metabolite upregulation within the muscle cells. We tend to think of improved cardiovascular in terms of the central, right? Our heart gets better, our blood vessels become a little bit more dilated. To a small extent, that's true, but most of the adaptations that result in improved cardiovascular conditioning are peripheral. They happen in the muscles involved and flexibility. So strength training will generally improve all of those. Now, an interesting point, this was uh, pointed out by Doug McGuff recently, hypertrophy, which is bigger, stronger muscles, is a side effect of training. All of those other things improve and your body adds more contractile protein into the muscle groups that were heavily worked as a protective mechanism against future bouts of physical stress. So what's the routine? Now, hear what I have to say before I get crucified here, because this is a uh, anathema to the fitness orthodoxy approach to fitness and bodybuilding. And even within the high intensity training camp, this is a very niche position. I believe the ideal bodybuilding routine is a consolidated routine um, that is split up between an A workout and a B workout and possibly a C workout, but I'll touch on that a little bit later. So to me, the ideal bodybuilding routine workout A would be like a chest press, an underhand pull down and a leg press or like a hack squat, some kind of compound pressing leg movements. Next workout would be a shoulder press, a pullover or some kind of horizontal row and some kind of hip hinging movement. Now, I'm a big believer that how you execute any particular exercise for the most part is far more important than the actual exercise selected itself. 
So in terms of execution, one set to failure. If you can safely generate enough intensity, one set is all you need to maximally stimulate all of the muscle fibers that you're capable of volitionally contracting within a particular muscle group. When people are performing multiple sets, they're not necessarily tapping into these higher level fast twitch fibers. A lot of times what happens is the slow and intermediate fibers because of the rest period between sets just get a chance to recover. So Mike Menser once uh, eloquently put it that you only need to push an elevator button once. You only need to fire one bullet from a gun to kill somebody. It only takes one sperm to fertilize one egg and create all of the muscular growth that happens in a person over the course of their life. Getting back to execution, you should have relatively brief rest between sets. What I tell my clients is you want to rest only as long as necessary to where you feel that you are capable of safely exerting another maximal effort on your next set. So if you perform a really heavy chest press, you're tired, you're breathing heavy, you're shaking, you're short on breath, maybe you're a little bit lightheaded. If you feel that you can't safely go to that next exercise, take all the time you need until you feel that you can safely move on to the next exercise. The advantage to keeping the rest periods relatively brief is you just increase the efficiency of your workout. You're not wasting time between your workouts. There's this badge of honor within the fitness community that people you know, say, I spend one hour, two hours, three hours a day at the gym. But most of that time in the gym is resting between sets or it's setting up equipment or it's bullshitting with your friends or it's checking your phone on social media. High intensity training is actually, it's not low volume training, it's high density training. There's very, very little wasted time. I generally recommend a time under load of 45 seconds to as high as about 180 seconds. And I've expanded on this window quite a bit the longer I train hits. Um, going lower than 45 seconds and the amount of force that you're applying with your muscles on your joints could represent a significant amount of shear forces that could accumulate to an undesirable amount of wear and tear. Going a little bit longer than three minutes, um, and there are some books like uh, the original Super Slow Protocol, um, Adam Zickerman's The Power of 10, that the time under load extends closer to like four, sometimes almost five minutes. For some people, if you go too long, you run the possibility that slow twitch muscle fibers will recover before you're ever able to tap into those fast twitch muscle fibers. And for some people, some people have an amount of lactic acid buildup that becomes so momentarily painful that the burn in their muscles ends up being a limiting factor before they fully fatigue the muscles that they're trying to work. So you kind of have to play with this a little bit. And you'll notice that if you're training people in high intensity training fashion long enough, some people generally respond a little bit better within certain ranges of this broad time under load kind of umbrella. People that tend to be a little bit more fast twitch dominant may make better progress in the 45 second to maybe 80 seconds, you know, kind of window. People that tend to have a little bit more slow twitch fibers may see better results going in the two minutes to upwards of almost three minutes. Um, and this is just something that you just have to train dozens or hundreds of people and supervise hundreds, if not thousands of workouts. And if you do this long enough, you start seeing these patterns. So that's why my time under load window has broadly expanded. Now, I recommend moving as slow as possible in each direction. The biggest reason for this is in moving relatively slowly, um, you are able to control the weight. And the biggest risk of injury that happens in the gym is people are using poor form and moving too fast. You have less control. You compromise on form. You offload the muscles that you're trying to work and you unload uh, muscles that you shouldn't necessarily work. And this can cause a significant injury if you're not careful. How slow is too slow? In general, I like seeing people move as fast as about three seconds in each direction. Generally, I tell people to move as slow as possible in each direction. And depending on the exercise that's being performed, it's going to be different for every exercise. Something with a relatively brief range of movement, like a toe press, um, also known as like a calf raise, you're only moving a couple inches as you do a heel raise. So that'll probably be closer to about three seconds in each direction. Something like a leg extension or a pullover where you have almost 180 degrees range of movement articulating about the knee or around the shoulder um, could take as much as 10 to 12 seconds in each direction. 
I really want to emphasize control with my clients. Now, in addition to controlling the weight and it being a little bit safer, if you look at the force velocity curve, you'll also see that the slower you move, the more torque the muscles are actually producing. And the reason for this is the faster you go, the more momentum comes into play. And the force velocity curve is not, you know, it's not linear. It's not straight. It's not if you move two seconds here and then four seconds that you're going to be producing, you know, half as much force by moving twice as fast. It's logarithmic. So if you look at a proper force velocity curve, moving very, very quickly produces very, very little force. You have high peak forces initially, but then momentum reduces the amount of torque necessary in that muscle group that you're trying to work throughout the rest of the range of movement. Moving very, very slow or contracting isometrically or eccentrically when you're lowering the weight actually produces the high amount of force production in the muscles that you're trying to work. So if you're trying to recruit as much muscle as possible per the force velocity curve, you should move as slow as possible. One last final uh, execution point. You want to train no more than three days per week on non-consecutive days. Don't ever train two days in a row. So let's unpack this a bit. I know what you're thinking. Like, Jerome, you must be out of your fucking mind. Like three exercises in one work, three total sets. Um, well, let's let's look at this. So the chest press has humeral abduction, which is going to work your chest. You know, to some extent, you have shoulder flexion, which is going to work the chest a little bit, and also the anterior delt, which is the front of your shoulder. You have elbow extension, so you're going to work all three heads of the tricep. So the chest press, you're going to have chest, anterior deltoid, and triceps all being adequately worked. Your hand pull down. You have shoulder extension, which is going to work your lats and to some extent the rear delts. You get all the way down on a pull down, you have scapular retraction as you're trying to pull your shoulders back. This is going to work the rear delts and the horizontal fibers of the traps. You have elbow flexion, which is going to work the elbow flexors, the biceps, the brachialis, which is underneath the biceps, and the brachioradialis, which is one of the muscles of the forearms. Now, if you're working a relatively long time under load, as you're doing an underhand pull down, it's going to be very fatiguing on your forearms. And grip work is going to adequately work the forearm flexors and extensors. Looking at a leg press, you have hip extension, which is the primary function of the glutes. But the hamstrings also attach above the hip. So one of the functions of the hamstrings, um, the secondary function, is hip extension. We tend to think of the hamstrings as just flexing the knee, but their secondary function is hip extension. You have knee extension, so you're going to be working the quadriceps as well. And finally, because as your feet come down, your toes tend to point backwards. And then as you press your leg, you get a little bit of plantar flexion. Your calves are going to be involved as well. At workout B, shoulder press. You're going to have humeral abduction, depending on how low you are when you start. Your arm is going to go straight out to the side. So you're going to work the medial delt. And then once your arm gets above parallel, you're actually going to have humeral adduction, which is still going to continue to work the medial delt. And having humeral adduction is just a little bit going to work the pec major, especially if you're leaning back just a little bit, as a lot of people do. They tend to arch their lower back just a little bit. So you will slightly involve the pecs, especially the clavicular fibers, in an overhead press. You have shoulder elevation, so you're going to be hitting the upper traps. You have elbow extension again, which is going to hit all three heads of the triceps. In a lat pullover, um, especially the bottom half of the range of movement in a pullover, or a horizontal row, you're going to have the following muscles get worked. Because you have shoulder extension, you're hitting the lats in the rear delt, and you have scapular retraction as you tend to pull the arms back. And if you're doing a horizontal row, you're going to work your elbow flexors, you're going to work your biceps, your brachialis, and your brachioradialis. Any kind of heavy rowing movement is going to heavily involve the forms as well, your forearm flexors and forearm extensors. And a hip hinge movement, like a deadlift, a torso extension on a hyperextension bench, or a stiff-legged deadlift, or maybe like a trap bar deadlift. You have hip extension, which again is going to work the glutes, and it's going to work the hamstrings. You have torso extension. Think about your upper torso coming up, which is going to work your lower back, and it's going to work your glutes. So does this routine meet all of the criteria that I started this presentation with? Well, does it stimulate growth in all muscle groups? Now let's look at it. You could probably point out you don't have any direct ab work. You don't have direct calf work. There's no real direct forearm work. 
And what about the neck? You know, is it neck training important? Well, your abs will flex isometrically to maintain torso stability on some of these exercises. I read a study once that a heavy bench press, just a free weight barbell bench press, works the abs, the rectus abdominis, the main muscles of a six pack, harder than an abdominal crunch. And the reason is your abs have to contract isometrically, meaning without movement, really, really hard to keep your torso steady as you're continuing to move weight. And especially in exercises like here in my studio, I have a lot of people talk about how hard the pullover works their abdominals because as their elbows are pushing against the weight, again, they have to contract their midsection really hard to counter the reactionary force of their elbows pushing down. And for people that still want a little bit more of an ab emphasis, when you're doing that underhand pull down, you can lean back maybe 15, 20, probably 30 degrees tops. And as you're pulling down, you're going to have to contract the muscles of the lower back. You're going to have to contract the muscles of the abs to maintain torso stability. I already mentioned you do get some uh, plantar flexion in a leg press. And as much as calves are used, and as much as this is one of those sticking points that people really have trouble getting this muscle group to grow, the conventional bodybuilding wisdom is to train it three, four, five, six days a week. Some people say you can train abs and calves every single session, but they still struggle to get their calves to grow. Given how much we walk, given how much we generally move, and given that calves have a decent degree of involvement on a squat or any kind of compound leg pressing movement, I strongly suspect calves are probably overtrained with a lot of direct calf work. And it's the reason why they're not growing for so many people. Now, I have a client here in my studio. I have a client that I've trained out of my house without doing any direct calf work. They've had growth of over an inch in their calves uh, while losing weights. And like I said, without any direct calf work, just compound leg pressing movements. What about forearms? Well, like I said, doing heavy rows and heavy grip work and having to grip something hard. You know, six-time Mr. Olympia, Dory Yates, never trained forearms. He got all of the forearm work that he needed to be at six-time Mr. Olympia um, just from gripping heavy, heavy handles to do heavy compound rowing movements. Um, similarly, I tend to think forearms are a muscle group that for a lot of people just don't have the capacity to get big. Um, and because they're involved in so many things, every time we grip something, every time we grab something, every time we move something, even a lot of people when they're squeezing handles in a pressing movement, you're working your forearms to some extent. And I strongly suspect that a lot of direct forearm work could very well be overtraining for the forearms. And thinking about it, as much as the abdominals, the calves, and the forearms function in almost every single compound movement that we're doing, um, for most people, they tend to be mostly constituted of slow twitch muscle fibers anyways. These are just muscle groups that generally do not grow big for a lot of people. Neck training. The reason I don't cover neck training in this particular routine is, is because not training the neck is better than improper neck training. Now, I do think most people, especially if you play some kind of contact sport, should do some kind of neck flexion, neck extension, and lateral flexion to each side. But I don't do it in my studio here, and I don't recommend specific protocol for people. I don't talk them through exactly how to do it because even if I gave someone exact, precise you know, methodology of how to do neck flexion, extension, or lateral flexion, um, if they mess it up, if they don't follow the instructions verbatim, there could be a little bit of blowback or even worse, they could potentially damage their neck. So if you really want to know how to train your neck on your own, look up a Doug McGuff video on uh, time static contraction for the neck and he covers it. And then if you want to do that on your own, um, be well aware of the potential risk that's associated with neck training. I, I think it is very important, but if, and this is a big if, if you are going to train neck, you have to train it properly. Now, former 20 plus year NFL strength and conditioning coach, Marcus Anovich, in one of his presentations, he points out a very, very close association, something like for every, for every one pound increase in neck flexion and extension strength became a certain percentage decrease in association with concussions in American football players. 
And this kind of makes sense that the stronger our neck is, the better we're able to brace our neck and keep proper head positioning, you know, in a sudden accident, um, which would keep our brain from rattling around as much, which would potentially cause less damage from a concussive type impact. Um, so again, I think neck training is important, but I don't directly recommend it to people because if you're not going to do it right, it's better that you don't do it at all. Now, does this routine, does this AB split routine use the least amount of volume for the optimal stimulus? Well, three sets in a workout, it, it's, it's hard to get much lower than that. And at most, you're going to be doing this routine every other day. And those are for the people that can recover very, very quickly. And those people are, are very few and far between um, within all of the individuals that go to the gym to try and get bigger and stronger. Most people, this routine is probably going to be best done once every five to seven days. So you do workout A, you rest five to seven days, you do workout B, you rest five to seven days, you go back to workout A. It's hard to get much lower in that in terms of volume. Does it produce the least amount of wear and tear? Well, yeah, these are going to be very, very slow repetitions and you have very, very low exercise volume. So some criticisms about this style of training. First of all, it's, you know, the thing you hear most directly is muscles need more direct work. You know, you need to work the abs, you need to work the forearms, you need to work biceps, right? There's not a single direct bicep exercise in this whole routine. Well, in my opinion, Henneman size principle takes care of this in all muscle groups that are involved in the exercise if you're training to failure. So a underhand pull down, for example, like I said, it's going to work the lats, it's going to work the forearms, it's going to work the biceps. And depending on where you are in that range of movement, each muscle group is going to have a different proportional amount of force that they are producing to move that weight. So let's say that you're at the very end of the set. You're on whatever your last repetition is, you're nearing the upper limits of your time under load window, and the weight is not moving. You're pulling as hard as you can in a certain position, and the weight is not moving. Different muscle groups proportionally are going to be producing different amounts of force. Because of this, different muscle groups will wear out sooner than others. So let's say you're almost all the way down and you're working primarily biceps, a little bit of lats and some forearms. And let's just say that your biceps are the first to fatigue because your biceps here are doing proportionally more work than anything else. When they fatigue other muscle groups involved, the lats, the rear delts, the forearms will have to proportionally increase the amount of force that they are producing. And that weight will still not be moving. So as long as you take that exercise to failure, first, the biceps will fail. The amount of force that they're producing is going down, 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 which means the lats, the rear delts and the forearms have to produce more and more and more and more and more force. And finally, when the amount of force that every single muscle group collectively is incapable of holding the weight in that position any longer, that's when the weight starts to go up, but this cannot happen until every muscle group is faced with an amount of force that it is no longer capable of producing. And this is the definition of momentary muscular failure. So if you're pushing hard enough and you're using an appropriate time under load and you can safely generate enough intensity, every primary muscle group that is involved in that kinesthetic chain will reach momentary muscular failure, which will create the optimal stimulus for growth as per Henneman size principle and that weight will safely return at the end position of the range of movement. So no, I don't think you need to do direct bicep exercises. I don't think you need to do direct forearm exercises. Well, what about the idea in bodybuilding that you have to hit things from different angles? You know, if you want fully developed shoulders, you know, you have to do lateral raises out to the side. You have to do some slightly out to the front. You need to do, you know, rear delt movements. You need to do overhead movements to work the long head of the tricep. Similarly, I, I tend to think Henneman size principle will take care of this as well. First of all, you can't shape a muscle differently with exercise. So Schwarzenegger used to say that if you're doing barbell curls, if you take a wide grip, you're going to work the medial head, of the bicep bicep is two muscles, medial head, and a lateral head. And if you have a narrow grip, you're going to be emphasizing more of the lateral head. Now let's just grant that this is true. And to some extent, yes, it is. But what happens again, if we train to failure, 
let's say we're taking a wide grip. Let's say hypothetically the medial head of the biceps is doing 55% of the work. The lateral head is doing 45. When you hit that last repetition and you're contracting as hard as you can, and it's not moving, the medial head of the bicep will more heavily fatigue than the lateral head. It will reach momentary muscular failure first. Now, as the force production in this medial head continues to go down because it's getting weaker and weaker and weaker with that weight, not moving the amount of force necessary produced by the lateral head goes up. And it's that collective amount of force that's being produced in the elbow flexors as a whole that determines whether or not the muscle group is moving or not, or sorry, whether or not the weight is moving or not. So again, as long as you are taking that exercise safely to momentary muscular failure, you are going to fatigue not only all of the slow twitch and fast twitch muscle fibers that you're capable of recruiting with Henneman size principle, but you're going to adequately work all of the muscle groups or sorry, all of the muscles in that particular group. You don't need to do a bunch of crazy, you know, variety of exercises for biceps. You don't need to do a tricep exercise from a variety of different angles to make sure you're hitting all three heads of the tricep. What you need to do is safely train to failure using an appropriate time under load and an appropriate weight that lets you get there. But what about people that say it's not enough volume? Well, my one set to failure is far more productive than most people's three to five sets. If you look at the way that most people conventionally exercise, a traditional set for most people, explosive one second up, maybe two seconds down. Um, so three seconds, one set would be 30 seconds if you're doing 10 reps, right? One second up, two seconds down times 10 reps, 30 seconds. And I don't even think most people's sets take that long. When I see people at the gym, an average set is 15 to 20 seconds for most people. Now remember, I'm recommending 45 to upwards of 180 seconds per set. Plus, I'm actually training to momentary muscular failure where most people aren't. Um, so if you look at the total amount of time lifting and lowering weights, my one set, let's just call it two minutes is going to be about three, four, five, six of most people's normal sets. I would have the same amount of time at every single position, you know, lifting and lowering the weight and the same amount of time under load. Time under load is the same, but I train with far more intensity. And again, intensity is the primary driver of muscle growth per Henneman size principle. Well, volume. This is an important distinction. Volume is not sets and reps. It's effort over time. Um, if you do three sets of a deadlift, that's 105 pounds, or you do one set of 315 pounds, is it the same amount of volume? Um, it, it doesn't matter the load that's being used. The actual number of sets and reps that you use don't matter if you're not training with sufficient intensity. People that are cyclists that sit on a stationary bike do large amounts of volume. If you think about the number of opens and closes that they have. Um, on that particular joint, you know, driving energy and, and kinesthetic movement through their legs, H insanely high amount of volume, but very, very moderately low intensity. A lot of people say it's not frequent enough. Well, training a muscle three times a week, even if you can recover and have some progress on a workout to workout basis, training a muscle three times a week does not produce three times faster results. Um, and this is a point that was made in the meta-analyses, evidence-based resistance training recommendations by James Fisher, James Steele, and Stuart Bruce Lowe. They came to the conclusion that there's very little to any benefit to training a muscle group more than once, maybe twice a week. Now, training three times a week does, however, produce three times the wear and tear on your body. And again, the ideal bodybuilding routine would give you the optimal amount of stimulus with the least amount of wear and tear. So some take home points, intensity is the primary driver of muscular growth, not volume. Besides it's a physical stress purposely performed for the desirable compensatory benefits, improve strength, improve flexibility, improve joint composition, improve cardiovascular conditioning, and finally hypertrophy, bigger muscles is a side effect. Similar to getting a suntan or trying to rub rough things on your hands to try and get a callus, you know, getting any more than gives you the optimal stimulus will either lead to a uh, traction wound or will lead to a sunburn. 
Minimum effective dose is just that. It's the minimum effective dose. And we should seek to apply this in every aspect of training. So that's essentially the presentation. Let me see if anyone hopped on. Declan is first. Declan was first last time. How you doing, buddy? Thanks for the uh, three bicep emojis. Rick, the 40-year carnivore, just completed my workout eating lunch. Yeah, what's for lunch, Rick? Side of iguana? And Jonathan, yeah, the man, the myth, the legend, as uh, Nicole, former factor, I'll calls him. Jonathan says hero. Thank you, sir. I, uh, I hold Jonathan in extremely high esteem. Um, and Jonathan recently put out a ebook, um, Advanced Hypertrophy or Secrets of Advanced Hypertrophy. So I will provide a link in the comments of this video after I'm done towards that. Um, and if you're looking for something that is going to take some of these principles, even if Jonathan and I disagree on, on some of the uh, more nuanced things, but I mean, we're essentially in agreement with 99% of things. And we recommend in general, the same basic guidelines in terms of exercise to a very high degree of uh, precision. But Jonathan put this book out and, and seriously, if anyone is interested, you know, maybe they're not seeing the results they think they should be getting in the gym, you will not be disappointed with Jonathan's book. And it's going to come at the cost of, of far less <laughs> than a consultation. You know, a couple of cups of coffee is, uh, is going to be the cost of this book. And it's going to save you so much time and money and headaches that I, I can't recommend it highly enough. Andre, good to see you, man. Andre says, what should be taken into account to define how often one can train? Do you consider the training dose sets per muscle group studies on muscle damage, protein synthesis, or just performance in the gym? Yeah, performance is number one. Um, not only your objective markers on how you performed with your current workout compared to your previous one, but also some of the subjective markers. Do you feel refreshed? Are you still sore? Are you ready and, and kind of looking forward to your training or do you just feel like you have some general malaise and uh, maybe apathy towards training that day? Um, you'll kind of know the longer you do this. You'll wake up one day and say, okay, I, I, I feel good. I'm ready to go. I know it's going to be hard, but I feel ready to train today. Um, everybody is a little bit different in terms of how long muscle protein synthesis lasts, in terms of how long certain inflammatory markers can last in some individuals. Um, some people are freaks and they can recover very, very quickly. I have some people in my studio that only train five sets every other week. Um, and I had to get them down to that point to continue to make progress. So it stands to reason, you know, if there are people that are genetically endowed with these gifts that make them big, strong and capable of recovering very quickly, you know, stands to reason that there's people on the other side of that spectrum too, that really struggle to recover, that need a very, very low dose of exercise and need a significant amount of time to recover from that. So I've given some guidelines in this presentation. I think as a starting point, if someone is looking at a consolidated routine, um, in general, there's really not a thing as too much rest between workouts, unless you're going two to three weeks for most individuals, but as a starting point for most individuals, based on, you know, the probably thousands now of personal training sessions that I've supervised over the years and here with my business, um, one workout every five to seven days is a good starting point for most people. And then from there, you kind of have to base it on a few things. You know, how are your numbers on a workout to workout basis? How do you feel? How's your mood? How's your appetite? How's your sleep? Um, there's a lot of things that kind of go into that. And actually uh, a consultation with Jonathan is actually probably one of the best ways to sort that out. Rick had some beef shoulder that was marked down two pounds worth. Man, I, you know, I go to this grocery store almost every day and look for marked down meat. Um, if you can find any kind of markdown, that's, that's always a win as a carnivore. Lambs, good to see you. Been able to stock up again. Yeah, Rick. All right. So since um, I should probably assign some composition coins, Declan was first. You get 100. <laughs> Rick was second. Rick gets 50 composition coins. And, uh, you know, Jonathan works for the company. He's a, a promoter out of the home office in uh, Wichita, Kansas. So Jonathan doesn't get any. But Andre gets 25 composition coins. <laughs> 
Jonathan doesn't like clickbait. Yeah, I don't either. I, I don't either. Susie hopping on. Hello, all. I'm joining late, but glad to catch you live. Happy Friday. Same to you. Happy Friday as well. All right. Well, I'm going to give this one more minute in case there's any other questions you can ask me about uh, consolidated workout routines, diet, supplements, exercise, uh, you know, in general life questions, anything that you guys want to ask. I'll wait for a minute. And I know that when you're live, usually dead air is the last thing that you want, but I have no problem um, subverting expectations. So I'm going to give this a minute. Now also seems appropriate to say that after I'm done with Jonathan training me for a contest in November, that I do plan on following this particular uh, workout protocol uh, for another contest prep. I would like to try and be as objective on a contest to contest basis as possible to see if um, my body responds a little bit better to one style versus another. But I know that at least for me, some of the best strength gains that I've ever had in the gym, the most productive routine I've ever had in the gym was a push pull leg split. And my push workout was chest press, shoulder press, tricep push down. My pull workout was a pullover supersetted with an underhand pull down, then bicep curls and a torso extension. And my leg routine was uh, leg extensions supersetted into a leg press leg curl calves. So no more than like four exercises a workout. That was the single most productive workout routine I've ever had. And compared to, you know, conventional bodybuilding routines, it's certainly far less volume and frequency. Lambs, I appreciate you uh, padding this runtime a little bit with a question. What about supplement? Which ones are useful? Um, I tend to think supplements are more context specific um, and also based on someone's individual needs. You know, here in Wisconsin, we were slowly creeping into fall. We're going to be seeing a shorter time in the sun. So I, I should probably consider um, using vitamin D on a regular basis. I'm currently using it for this contest prep, but at least going into winter, there's a lot of people here that I strongly suspect have seasonal affected disorder, probably as a result of not getting enough sun. Um, taurine, Harry Serpano's raves about, Jonathan recommends it. I've had good uh, N equals one experience with taurine creatine um, for people, especially if you're not eating you know, large amounts of beef. If you're not on a carnivore diet and you're exercising on a regular basis, you probably should be taking creatine monohydrate um, to bolster your workout numbers a bit. Um, and then maybe you know everything else is kind of context specific. If you, if you struggle with sleep, as important as sleeping is you know, maybe melatonin, uh, GABA, um, I could even see maybe like a, a nighttime tea. Some people find some benefit with. So, um, ideally if you're following a species appropriate diet and you have a lot of things in life kind of worked out, not too stressed, getting adequate sleep, enough hydration, probably don't need any supplements. You probably shouldn't if you're, if everything else is kind of on point. So, but if something's off, right, um, there are certainly supplements that can help. You're always waiting for the big one, right? Yeah, Rick had a, everyone needs to follow his channel. I'm guilty. I need to watch more of his videos too. Um, I think Rick had a heart attack scare a while back. Is that correct? Jonathan says, Jerome has a better presentation than me. Uh, no, that's not true. Um, Jonathan puts a tremendous amount of time and research in those presentations and editing them. And I just tend to create these relatively quickly. And then I go live and hopefully don't embarrass myself too badly. <laughs> Andre says, do you find it helpful to vary exercises as a way to combat strength plateaus? It's just a matter of preference. Um, there's something to be said in terms of exercise selection. So Jonathan and I also put out a pocketbook to exercise selection. It's available on his website, Composition Consultant. Uh, what's it, Jonathan? Three British pounds? I always get that number wrong. I always think it's five, but um, I'm way off on that. I think it's three pounds. So, you know, maybe maybe four US dollars or so. And we really break down a number of highly effective exercises based on biomechanics. So 
if you're picking one of maybe four to six exercises for any particular muscle group, um, you're going to be giving it about as good of a stimulus as you can. Now, the strength for any exercise or for any muscle group, and I covered this in the presentation a bit, it's a little bit multifaceted. Some strength improvements are going to happen as a result of the hypertrophy of the muscles involved. And part of your strength improvements is going to happen as a result of improved neuromuscular um, conditioning of that neurological pathway, your brain and your spines and your central nervous systems signaling to that musculature gets more efficient the more you do it. So when people do hit strength plateaus, and eventually everybody will plateau, you can only build so much size and strength. Um, but if you're hitting a plateau relatively early in your training, it's probably number one, I would say you have to make sure you're working out with enough intensity. And if your intensity is there, the next most likely culprit is there's something about your recovery that needs to be addressed. Your workout volume might be too high. You might be exercising too frequently. You might be not getting enough sleep. Um, it's possible you're not getting enough total food or maybe need a little bit more fat or a little bit more protein. It's a lot of potential causes that could contribute towards a strength plateau. But normally, you don't just see a plateau randomly happen. It's not like you're making progress, making progress, making progress, and all of a sudden hard plateau for like six weeks. Normally, when people are relatively new to training, they see significant strength improvements at least the first six months to a year, and then it slowly tapers off. And as you see this coming, um, you can usually get a little bit ahead of it if you've been training people long enough and if you've worked with someone to really understand kind of the nuances of their exercise execution and everything else that's going into the lifestyle. Um, as you start seeing strength slow down to almost a crawl, you can usually take adjustments a little bit before a plateau happens. But if someone's relatively new to exercise and they're not making progress and they haven't had significant improvement in, you know, certainly at least a month, um, then I would say there's something probably on the recovery aspect that needs to be addressed. Rick had a funny heart attack. I didn't think heart attacks were funny. That's, that's why there's that expression serious as a heart attack. <laughs> I do need to watch your channel. I apologize, Rick. Just finished 350 grams of steak and five eggs. And we saw the stream and started YouTube's. Yeah, I have the same problem with YouTube. Um, I don't get notifications a lot of time. And I, I've messaged Jonathan, uh, AKA Carnivore Muscle, about this before. Sometimes I'll get a notification on my phone about a video that he premiered eight hours prior. So the fact that anybody showed up for this, um, I'm quite flattered. Uh, now also seems an appropriate time to say for anyone that's not in the live chat, if anybody's watching this um, after this video, has already premiered. Um, if you have any questions at all, something you want me to cover the next time I go live, just leave it in the comments below. And if I see it in the comments, because notifications are also shit sometimes with telling people that someone commented on a video, um, if I see it, then I'll either respond to it directly or I'll cover it in the next video that I do. All right. So with that being said, I hope everyone found this um, presentation, if not informative, at least, at least thought provoking. Um, you know, as individuals who have an interest in strength training, bodybuilding, or just, you know, being healthier, um, let's not forget that exercise is a physical stress on the body and it's deliberately performed on the body so that we can reap the positive adaptive response that happens as a result of that physical threat. So again, we want the least amount of physical stress to produce the optimal benefit and no more so that we can reap the maximal benefit with the least amount of long-term damage to our body. So I want to thank everybody for their time today. Thank you, uh, everyone who was here for the first video, Andre, Declan, uh, Rick might have been there. Um, <laughs> I apologize for how awful that first video was, and uh, I'm done, done with coffee. I'm going to go the full Sean Baker, um, Anthony Chafee, 100% carnivore, 100% of the time routes. Um, but I suppose that's a topic for another time. Thanks everyone for your time. I'll talk to you guys soon.